I'm an orthopaedic surgeon. I work at a place called the South West London Elective Orthopaedic Centre in Epsom. It's a, an elective centre that was started in 2004 after years of planning and we do all the joint replacements for South West London. We do over 3,000 joint replacements a year and it's the highest volume centre in Europe. So that's where I work and I'm the director of research there and I'm the professor of orthopaedics at St George's which is just up the road. And so I have a lovely time. But I, I do remember, um, uh, be, I remember walking up a mountain in Ireland with my father as a, about the age of 13. And he said to me, now have you decided what you're going to do for a career? And before I had a chance to answer it, he said, well, of course, of course, I mean, the last thing you're going to do is be a doctor or even a surgeon. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, firstly, you're squeamish, and secondly, you're hopeless with your hands. And I just thought, speak for yourself, mate. <laughs> and so I suppose uh, I've always wanted to prove him wrong. But no, I've always, in, I've always enjoyed playing with my hands. So when I was at school, the only thing I excelled in was carpentry. And when I was at medical school, the only thing I was any good at was motorbike restoration. So when I qualified as a doctor and found myself in an orthopaedic operating theatre, it was fairly obvious what I was going to do. I have no desire to hang up my scalpel. I just love operating. It's just, just such a nice thing to do. And you walk out of theatre at the end of a good day's operating and there is no better feeling. So the operating is still enormous fun. Now I do know that some surgeons say that there comes a point when you just don't want to do another operation. And that will probably come to me at some point, but I haven't got there yet. If I was looking at ambitions outside of operating, uh, there are two areas that I am interested in. The way I look at the orthopaedic world we're in, we, since the invention of joint replacement in the 50s and 60s, we have really been having the most wonderful time putting ironmongery into people's bodies and, and getting great results. But it is very primitive surgery and it could be so much more sophisticated, so much more elegant if we can just get tissues to repair themselves and grow back. And so where we've had 50 years of the, the great era of metalwork and plastic, I think that the next 50 or 100 years are going to be a fantastic era of regenerative medicine and, and all the technology that's going to be involved in that is going to be incredibly exciting. So we're at the very, very cusp of the beginning of it. I won't see the great advances, but it would be lovely to be involved in those early steps. One of the minor contributions I've made in, in my career is in gathering data and reporting it and recording it and outcome data. And when I first became a consultant, I remember taking a database that had been developed by my old boss in Cambridge, Richard Villa, down to London and thinking, right, if I can do this, then I can gather data and write papers and all these things. And I went to all my colleagues in the hospital and said, now I want to set up a, a database and gather that data and have outcomes and report on how we're going. And they said, well, is that research? I said, no, 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 it's not research. They said, well, it's not service delivery and it's not research, and it's not audit, so there's no funding for it, very sorry. And there really was absolutely no enthusiasm for gathering outcomes 20 years ago. And it's only now that it's politically desirable. And it was fortuitous that I did it anyhow. And what is quite clear is that if you look at the way um, imaging has developed over the past 20 years, we now have a thing called a DICOM standard. So any X-ray or MR scan or CT scan or any kind of scan you have, it has to be in a certain format called DICOM. And that means that if you've had a scan from one company's machine, it can show up on any display and it's the same from another company's machine. They used to be not interchangeable. And now we can even ship images from one hospital to another using this format because they all follow this protocol. Well, the world has got interested in registries and outcome data, but we're all collecting it in databases with different structures. And I would hope that in the next five to ten years, there will be an industry-agreed structure for recording our data so 
so that we can then start extracting data from multiple different databases. So different people will develop wonderful new platforms, wonderful new ways of gathering data, wonderful new ways of reporting the data. But if it's all in the same format, then we'll be able to pool it, share it, and really learn much faster. So I'd like to be involved in that if I can. Hip arthroscopy is going to get easier because we've been doing really pretty primitive surgery. Uh, it was uh, many, many years before we really had a good raison d'etre for what we were doing and why. And we're only beginning to understand the pathomechanics of how hips work. Uh, so there's going to be a parallel evolution in the imaging and the computer simulations and the understanding of the kinematics of how our body moves that allows us to work out whether the hip is unstable or catching or stuck or the wrong shape. And until we have that knowledge, we can't really do the best surgery. So for young people getting involved in the field, they really need to understand what is the problem. And if you understand the problem, you've got a fighting chance of making it better.